Hello my loves and welcome back to the first episode of Strange Playgrounds for quite a long time. Yeah, I must have been anticipating this one though. I mean, come on. I mean, I'm surprised that um, I didn't do one just in anticipation of this film. Hellraiser. Hellraiser 2022. Of all the beloved horror franchises of the 1980s, one that really could have stood a proper reboot, a proper resurrection over the, the last couple of decades is definitely Hellraiser. Hellraiser is unusual in that, unlike, say, Halloween, where the real story was finished after the first film, certainly Michael Myers' story was finished after the first film, didn't warrant or need or require any more fucking sequels, let alone 20 hundred odd, which it currently has, I believe. I believe the official total of Halloween films is umpteen million. Um... But Hellraiser, there were still stories to tell, there was still something to be explored, certainly after Hellraiser 2 with the the expanded mythology of the multiple boxes and Leviathan, the god of the Cenobites, the way Cenobites are made and all of that, the labyrinth of the Cenobites and all of that gubbins. There was so much worthy of exploration there. Um, and extended media has gone on to do that. The films generally don't. The films just largely just completely ignore that mythology and just go for really, after that point after hellraiser 2 they just go for really boring set pieces where it's like some of them are mildly amusing in a visual way but there's nothing deeper there there's nothing to get your teeth into unfortunately um but the comic books and whatnot the extended media they do go into it and they they have some very bizarre and interesting interpretations of what's going on with the cenobites I mean, in the Marvel comics that came out in the, in the wake of the original films, Leviathan is a god of absolute and supreme order. That's why he manifests as a geometrically perfect diamond. That's why he transmutes or surgically makes flesh into patterns, right? It's a way of exercising dominion over the disorderly nature of flesh and it's a really weird take for me that's not the way i would have done it personally i like the more chaotic interpretation of leviathan that you get in hellraiser 2 which is that he is a god of flesh hunger and desire you know i like that far far more Either way, it's interesting. It relates to the, Cenob the Cenobites' BDSM nature. You know, these uh, these creatures as ag agents of absolute dominion. Yeah? yeah, but also in their own strange way, products of submission. I mean, that's part of the thematic interest of the Cenobites. And for me, any new film interpretation or entry in the series that takes itself halfway seriously, that isn't just some attempt to hold on to the the film rights which the last couple of films largely have been needs to take that into account um and of course now i have managed to watch hellraiser 2022 um i could say I, I am pleasantly surprised by it i mean i was i was very prepared to be disappointed by this one very prepared it was it was highly likely that it wasn't going to meet expectation or that it was also yeah you know, every potential that it was going to be an unholy mess um I was excited by a lot of the build-up, a lot of the stuff I saw. So, for example, the new Cenobites. The Cenobites have largely been completely reimagined. The sort of BDSM elements have been toned down a little bit, and they've gone for a more abstract, and far closer, by the way, to how they appear in the original novella, The Hellbound Heart. In The Hellbound Heart, they're far more ethereal, strange, bored, esoteric than they are in the films. Even the original film, which of course it you know, was written alongside the novella by Clive Barker. Th th they are very different entities between film and novella. This is the closest they have ever been to achieving that same status. Um, I was excited by the designs because they looked really interesting. I was excited by what I was hearing about the way bits of the mythology have been incorporated. The images that showed you different configurations of the box. So it's not just the lament configuration. That's just the box. That's just the cube. It has multiple different configurations in this mildly reimagined 
uh, mythology that do different things and that have different consequences and produce different effects. So it has like the um, the law configuration, the love configuration, the resurrection configuration, and the power configuration, which is of course the geometric diamond that is Leviathan. Um, I am very very pleased to report that. It's a fun film. It's a very coherent, well-paced, well-written Hellraiser film. It's certainly miles better than, on an objective technical level, than anything that's been in the franchise for decades. Decades and decades, barring some of the comics. It's, in terms of... Status, for me, it sits just underneath Hellraiser 2. Just underneath. For me, it's it's Hellraiser, Hellraiser 2, and this one, Hellraiser 2022. Um, the reason it works for me... And I, by the way, I am absolutely aware that it's not going to work for everyone. This is very much a reimagining of the franchise. It's a reboot of the franchise, so it doesn't have the same qualities as the original films. Um, one thing that I do um, ironically lament is that because the original two films were produced under such duress, because they had such small budgets, because they were you, they were working with a limited crew, and because of just the nature of filmmaking at the time, they have this patina of dirt about them which gives them texture. And I like that in horror films. I like the sort of grewy, grind housey, um, patched together quality that you often Often get in horror films of that era. Obviously, this film doesn't have that. It's a little bit more slick, it's a little bit more clean, it's a little bit more coherent. And that's not to say that it doesn't have texture, it does. It's just that the texture of the film is very different. The intention of the film and the nature of the film is very different. This is not Hellraiser from the 1980s. This is something different. This is taking the, the the core concepts of the mythology, the core imagery, and doing something different with it. That said, structurally and thematically, it is closer to Hellraiser 1 and 2 than any of the others. For one thing, unlike the vast majority of the other films, it actually has theme and structure. Um, just like in Hellraiser 1, you get all of that wonderful Ibsen stuff. You get the, the sort of almost like comedy of manners, ma and the, the, the domestic farce almost married to the horrific elements and the surreal elements. Here, you've got a similar thing playing out. The, uh, the, the, the principal character is a drug addict named, uh, a recovering drug addict named Riley. And she's a really fascinating lead because she is so damaged, because she is so problematic. Um, she's fascinating to follow. Very unusual. Even nowadays, very, very unusual as a horror film protagonist. She is damaged. She is difficult. She is problematic. But, and this is key, she doesn't, fa she doesn't fall into that pit of being entirely hateful. If the film did that, which a lot of horror films do, a lot of horror films, especially these days, love to apologise for the torments that they put their protagonists through by making the protagonists hateful. That doesn't work for me. If you've got a hateful protagonist then who's going to be put through the ringer, unless it's really well done, then you may as well not watch it. It's like, sort of, well, I don't care. You know, I have no connection to that character. Um, it can be done, and it can be done really well. You can have protagonists that are entirely execrable, but which are engaging still on a human level. And this kind of does that. Riley is a phenomenally problematic character, and much of of the much of the early film but this is another thing i like about the film actually it's really slow paced it's structured like the original hellraiser so at the very beginning of the film you get to see a sequence where it shows you what's going on effectively it gives you a structure for what's going on where you get imagery of the barks and of the chains and the hooks and all of that kind of thing very like the original hellraiser and then it switches to the domestic where you have riley who is basically down and out she's quite a young woman she's in like her early to mid 20s but she's down and out she's living with her brother in his flat which is already oversubscribed she's under constant watch by him she clearly regrets everything that she done in her life and that's the key to the film actually that is the theme of the film it's regret what they've done is taken that notion of the lament 
configuration and expanded that out to be the theme of the story. That is Riley's story. It's the fact that she regrets her life up till this point and that ultimately there is no way of fixing it. It doesn't matter what she does. As I mean, there's a, I mean I'm going to spoil loads of this film by the way so you haven't seen it go and watch it because I'm going to spoil it. There's a sequence right at the end where she has an encounter with the hell priest jamie by the way jamie clayton whoa jamie clayton is amazing in this film we'll get to it but she has like a final encounter with the hell priest and the hell priest spells it out to her basically tells her well all right this is your suffering this is your choice this is your prize for solving the puzzle this is what you've chosen your exquisite suffering will be your regret your life will be your prize and it's kind of cool i really like that i like the fact that the film has that theme running through it and has that sort of through line that gives it a bit more depth than just being like a a visual feast which it very easily could have been now does it go far enough with that maybe not i this is just my personal bias but I would have liked to have seen a bit more of that to give it weight. I would have liked to have seen Riley be a little bit more execrable, to be honest. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of what... A lot of it's implied. You get that she's a wreck and that she's ruined every relationship she's ever had, that she's alienated, that she's estranged, and that she's fried. Like, because of her experiences with drugs and alcohol and being down and out, her mind is fried. She has incredibly emotional reactions to almost everything, and that's what leads her ultimately down the the path of darkness towards the Cenobites. Um... I could have done with a bit more of that. I would have liked to have seen her be a bit more ambiguous. Like, I would have liked to have seen her, I don't know, do something pretty bad. Like, maybe steal something from one of her flatmates to, to, to score, to get drugs, or something like that. You know, something to that effect. Don't get me wrong, some of the stuff she does is pretty terrible in this film. And it does go there. It just, for me, maybe doesn't go deep enough. I would have liked to have seen her be a bit more. And also, as a result of that, see the, the resultant revelation of the Cenobites into her life reflect that a bit more. That would have been interesting thematically. You know, in the same way that in the first film, it's Frank, Larry and Julia, technically, it's and, and Kirsty, it's their family dynamic that the Cenobites ultimately come into and play with as a kind of game. That is here. It is here in this film, but it's not quite explicit enough. It is, it's, it's not quite as deep enough. It's good. It's there. And I can see why for like pacing reasons there isn't too much of it because that family stuff does go on for a long time there's some very complex relationships drawn here and i really liked that i loved riley's brother matt and his his partner great to see overtly gay characters in a hellraiser film again maybe a bit more of that would have been interesting um but i liked that too um the characters are actually pretty much all interesting enough, all coherent enough, all complex enough to be carried through. I liked all of them. Um, and even, like, you know, the ones who are clearly disposable, who are going to, to die, which are very identifiable, by the way. It's, there is, there are flickers of sympathy for them. In fact, there's one in particular that I really felt for throughout the course of this film. I really felt for them. They have what is arguably the most explicit sort of Cenobite hooks, chains, and everything scene. And it's really good. It's very well done. Um, I liked all of the characters. I liked them all. Even the, the most sort of stereotypical two-dimensional of them which is Voight. Voight is a a billionaire who is hedonistic and he is basically trying to trying to you know he's a bit like Dr. Chenard but doesn't have the depth of Chenard. Chenard's interest is academic and philosophical whereas this guy it's completely selfish but the the film and its redrawn mythology actually makes space for that it makes it work because that is the nature of the sense Cenobites now. There is a redrawing of the mythology here, which I actually really like. It makes them a bit more it makes them a bit more coherent. I mean, part of the intrigue of the first certainly the first two films in the Hellraiser mythos is that the rules of the Cenobites are difficult to define because they seem to break them quite a lot in both films, you know? Um, and that makes it interesting. There is this sort of nightmare logic to them. In this, they are more 
defined. There are rules that def- that apply to the box. There are rules that apply to the Cenobites, and they must abide by them. Not only that, but the game they play with those who use the box is infinitely more complex now. It's not just a case of you open the box, the Cenobites come, and they give you a twisted version of what you desire. That does happen. But now there are stages to the game. The box opens in different ways and has different configurations depending on lots of different factors like what you what desire you open it with what you want from it and what ultimate part of the game you want to stop at so there is like there's the lament configuration which is the box there's the resurrection configuration which is much more of a complex shape there's the law configuration there's the love configuration there's the leviathan configuration which is the power configuration the final configuration of the box Uh, and sort of like the most ascended version that's the divine form of the box if you like and each one has different effects and different outcomes uh, and the Cenobites do give you a different gift they're much more like the Cenobites in the book these ones they're they're, they're like jinn they're gift givers it just so happens that the gifts they give don't always necessarily line up with what their summoners want or expect yeah they're much more gift givers they have less overt agency in this film than they do in the original ones they're so bound by the box that it's reasonably easy to evade them or to to put circumstances in place where you can escape them um and that's the game that Voigt is playing he's essentially bored hedonistic he's been trying to summon them for ages he succeeds at the beginning of the film and ultimately what he's given is not what he wants and then he starts to play the game again to try and to try and um to garner a new boon effectively to summon them to summon not only them but leviathan leviathan is in this film and to to have what he said in his journal have an audience with god leviathan one of the things i absolutely frigging love in this film and i love it is that it sells the infernal divinity of leviathan to the nth degree leviathan is a god in this film an elder god sort of like a lovecraftian god but a god nonetheless and when an audience is sought with it boy is it climactic it's really cool the more abstract stuff the places that this film pushes the mythology to i really really enjoyed i liked that a heck of a lot there's not much of it and it's deliberately left vague because if there were too much it wouldn't work and i maybe could have done with a little bit more of the abstract the weirdness maybe a little bit more of that i could have done with them pushing it if they were going to go there pushing it into the the stratosphere you know making it really weird making it as weird as hellraiser 2 was you know with its dario argento stylings it doesn't necessarily go there it's a slightly different film to that but it does have echoes of that and i really applaud it for that i liked those elements maybe if there's another film which i think there probably will be in the future they will go there the cenobites themselves are wonderful in this film they are the core of the appeal it's not just the cenobites which are beautifully designed to a one these cenobites are the best that they have been since the original films they're not jokey they're not hokey they're not gimmicky they are actually beautiful these creatures they are morbidly grotesquely beautiful and each one of them is disturbing interesting very intriguing presence and of course the greatest of them is jamie clayton as the hell priest she absolutely nails this it's so easy i mean her her makeup her costume is so big it's so overt it's so extreme it would be very easy to have made that presence risible when it's supposed to be profound and threatening and intriguing but jamie clayton plays it beautifully she underplays every element of it she is stately she is quiet and she is profound there are flickers of the most almost imperceptible emotion 
across her face at certain points. And it's wonderful. Her motions are all stately and graceful. Her presence in the film is magnificent. It's absolutely magnificent. I also love the way, because this film can do it, it has the budget and it has the technology behind it, you really get to see how opening the box, solving the box allows opens the way into leviathan's labyrinth but also allows the labyrinth to impose itself on our reality it does it in very beautiful ways this time round the box really does distort and undo reality around it there's a particular sequence in a van that i won't spoil for you but it shows you how it doesn't matter what's happening in the material world. It doesn't matter what's happening in the physical world. Even if you're in motion, the labyrinth, if it has a claim on you, will find you. And there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, one of the other other ways in which the mythology is changed, and this is either for better or worse, I can kind of understood, understand why they did it, because it does lend threat and pace to the film, but it, I, maybe it does undermine some of the essential elements of the mythology. So in the... In Hellraiser 2, you have that wonderful statement, well, probably one of the best moments of the Cenobites, where um, Tiffany solves the box for Chenard, the Cenobites come, the female Cenobite is just about to lay into Tiffany, and the, the Hell Priest turns up and he says, no, it's not hands that call us, it is desire. One of the best lines in the entire mythos, one of the best lines. In this version of the mythology, it's slightly different. If you solve the box into any given configuration, then a blade flies out of it and it cuts you. And if you're marked, if you're cut by the blade, then you are claimed. The Cenobites are going to come for you. And that does undermine certain elements of it. I mean, people don't open the box innocently, that's for sure. Any more than Kirsty does in the original film. I mean, you can make the argument that Kirsty's opening of the box is interesting because it's it's somewhat innocent, you know. Although at that point you could argue she's already seen Frank, so she knows what's going on. She knows what she's getting into. Um, it's orig in this film. It's initially uh, Riley, obviously, who solves the box and who opens it. And of course, because of her nature, because she is an addicted, broken personality. That's what the Cenobites play on. It's they give interestingly, they give her a choice. They give her a bargain. Uh, which is it's the it's the bargain that they give to Kirsty or that Kirsty moots, which is of course take someone else and you can let me go. And of course the Hell Priest is all up for that. It's fun, it's a game, right? In this film, you really do get the impression that it's more of a game it's a it's fun for the cenobites and all but it's also serious i mean it's a game but it also has all of the patina and the ethos of a religious ritual and i kind of love that are there moments of slight horror silliness in it yes are there moments that don't necessarily need to be in it yes um are there predictable elements yes there's a character who is so obvious the twist for that character is so freaking obvious i won't even bother it's so 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 clear from the very beginning what his game is it's so <laughs> obvious but that's not really a problem there are there's enough in the character to make him intriguing there's enough in him could it have gone further? Yes. I would have liked it to be less clean, as I mentioned before. I would have liked there to have been more sex, more and explicitly so. I would have liked there to have been more dirt and patina. I would have liked there to have been more drugs-related stuff, if that's where they were going to go. Um, but that said, it's it's more than I expected. It really is more than I expected. Um, and I am pleasantly surprised. I am surprised that I enjoyed a Hellraiser film in 2022 as much as I did. There's some really interesting stuff done here with the mythology, with the characters, with the Cenobites themselves, and... If it if it does go forward, I'm very much looking forward to the next film. I'm very if this one sort of echoes and rhymes with Hellraiser One, could the next film echo and rhyme with Hellbound? Let's hope so. Eh? That could, that could be very very interesting indeed. Who knows? Until next time, my loves. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you.